By simply using clay and organic matter, you can create an oven that is beautiful, versatile, energy efficient, and it will cook delicious meals. We want to share this idea because we believe it can create business opportunities and help with the deforestation problem around the world. Hi, we're John and Flip, and we'll explain with photos how we build a rocket oven. Dr. Larry Winiarski taught us how to make a mud rocket stove for use in Haiti. At the end of this video, we'll direct you to a website for detailed instructions on building a rocket stove and also a rocket oven. We took two molded skirts, inverted one on top of the other, and made a mini kiln with a mud rocket stove. Adding a chimney created more draft and heat. It worked well firing pottery pieces. Next, we tried baking bread in the same setup. We removed the chimney to decrease the draft and keep it from getting too hot. The bread came out perfect and set us on a course to build a rocket oven. We did some research on mud ovens and were inspired by this photo in a wonderful book by Kiko Denzer called Build Your Own Earth Oven. However, our rocket oven design is different and unique because it has a live fire during the cooking process, using much less fuel and giving off very little smoke. We bought a kiln shelf to serve as the baking surface. It will sit at the top of the rocket stove as later photos will show. This is how we got an idea of the finished oven dimensions. I gathered some apple prunings, stuck them in the ground, and began to construct a dome. Flip called me over to bend the pruning tops back down into the structure, and Flip finished up the dome. Behind John, you can see the rocket stove we will use to fire the oven. The stove is sitting on a box using bricks for insulation under the fuel feed. John is cutting a hole in the plywood that will support the oven. The stove combustion chamber has ceramic pieces in it to create air turbulence and thus cleaner emissions. Because the weight of the oven will be so heavy, we attach stout legs to the table. This shows how the rocket stove will sit under the oven. The combustion chamber and bricks are removable to make repairs possible. The table will be covered three inches deep with a mixture of 50% clay and 50% organic matter to protect the plywood from the heat of the oven. The firewood will rest on the bent cans. There is a grate made from lengths of rebar behind the cans that rest in the notches in the lower, thinner bricks. Air flows through the cans and up through the burning wood. Very little ash and charcoal are formed. The grate is critical because with the grate, a hot fire can be maintained for long periods of time. Without the grate, the airflow gets blocked by ash and charcoal. I used cardboard templates to make the door. The smaller piece is what will be the insulation part of the door. Screws were added to the plywood door so twine could be woven on them to hold the clay mixture that will insulate the door. The twine was round around the screws above the wood. John mixed up the clay in organic matter. This is the organic matter we used. It was passed through a half inch screen. Once it was well mixed, we began to spread the clay mixture on the table. From past experience, we've learned that dissolved sugar and or potash make the clay mixture more durable when it dries. Packing the mixture into place. Next time we will wrap the sides of the stove top with newspaper so the clay doesn't stick to it. That way it will be removable if repairs are needed. We were so pleased with the smooth top. We think a countertop like this in Haiti would be well received. In Haiti, rather than a table sitting over a rock stove, it could look like this using stone and soil, only the stoves would be recessed into the structure with the stovetop flush with the counter. I set the dome in place. In the process of shortening the dome, the bottom diameter expanded from 23 inches to 25 inches. Flip cut up an old sheet and put it over the dome to keep the clay mixture from coming through the wood frame. A couple layers of lightly moistened newspaper would work as well. We began to cover the dome with the first of three layers. This layer is one and a half inch thick. Flip began figuring out how the door will work. The oven began to take shape. There is a piece of four inch PVC stuck in the top for the chimney hole. Flip used a smaller piece of cardboard to build the spot where the insulating mud mixture on the inside of the door will fit. The smooth arch around the cardboard is where the wood part of the door will seat. There is no clay on the door yet. We left it in place to support the clay arch. We put on two handles because we expect the door to be heavy with the clay insulation. The middle layer of the oven dome will be an insulation layer, and for it we use seven gallons of grass stems we got from a seed cleaning warehouse and two gallons of seed screenings. We also added one gallon of hay straw. 
The dry materials were mixed together in a wheelbarrow, and then we poured in three gallons of a clay slurry, the consistency of paint, made with a drill and painter mixer bit to blend clay and water in a five-gallon bucket. The ingredients were mixed to coat the dry materials with the clay slurry. This is how the insulation layer looked added to the dome. We tried to also make this layer one and a half inches thick. The oven dome is now ready for the last layer. Horse manure was screened through a half inch screen and a quarter inch screen. For the last layer we used eight gallons of the finer manure sawdust and eight gallons of thick paste-like clay also made with a drill and paint mixer. We alternated layers of manure, clay, and hay straw. Everything was mixed together using John's muck boots and hands. Eight gallons of clay, eight gallons of manure, and about a gallon of hay straw all mixed together. It was sticky stuff. We began to spread layer number three. Our goal was one inch for this layer. Flip began to work on adding the clay mixture to the door. We weren't sure the clay would stick to the door when it dried, but it did. The oven dome was now complete. We expected to be waiting several weeks for the oven to dry out before we burned out the apple printings. However, Larry Winiarski suggested we put a deflector plate under the chimney in the top of the dome to get more uniform heat inside the oven. In order to put in the deflector disc, the clay needed to be moist which meant we had to cut out the apple pruning dome support. With the apple prunings gone, we smoothed the inside of the oven. This took quite a bit of time. Kiko's book suggests an alternative method for forming the dome. He uses a pile of moist sand covered with newspaper to shape the oven interior. The dome layers are plastered over the sand pile. Once the oven dome is built, the sand is removed through the door. Flip used the very pottery pieces we fired in the mini kiln that inspired this oven to suspend the deflector plate that Larry had suggested for the top of the oven. We placed the deflector disc on the rocket stove pot rest and then set the kiln shelf on two inch stilts. This will be our baking surface and it should also work to deflect the heat sideways so that the heating will be more uniform. This is our attempt at making our own baking surface. Once it is dry we will fire it in the oven. Larry came by and suggested putting the door back in place and firing up the oven to begin drying it out. We lined the edges of the door insulation with newspaper so it wouldn't stick to the oven doorway. The fire to dry out the oven is lit. We kept the fire going for over eight hours and it didn't take that much wood or make that much ash for all the burning. Temperatures inside the oven were ranging from 350 degrees Fahrenheit to over 500 degrees. We inserted a candy thermometer through the wall of the oven to measure the temperature while we dry it out. Late in the day, large cracks started showing up in the sides of the oven. John sealed them with more clay. By the end of the day, steam was rising off the oven all over. The next morning we opened up the oven. We learned that we should have dried the door out before subjecting it to the fire. The plywood behind the clay kept the moisture from escaping, which deformed the clay mixture. The interior seems to be in good shape, although it was blacker than we had hoped. There is a little ash on the baking surface, but it isn't much for over eight hours of fire, and it's easy to brush off. A look from above down the chimney hole after the first firing. I moistened the surface and spread some soft clay mixture over this to fill in the gaps and cover up the exposed straw. John embedded four rocks in the top of the oven that rise about one inch above the chimney hole. He used a ceramic tile to make sure they were the same height and level. I set a pot on the four embedded rocks, then wrapped a pot skirt around the pot. We can bake and boil at the same time like this. The oven can also function as a regular rocket stove when you remove the baking surface and deflector plate. Another pot could be simmering on top of the oven. The oven was only a few days old, but we decided it was time to try it out. Flip brought out pizza ingredients, a little tomato sauce, followed by some pesto, salami, cheese. Now we're ready to put in the first pizza. Even though the door isn't perfect, it works really well. In it goes. Now it's time to shut the door and see if this oven will really work. Three minutes later, what did we find inside? Party time! It tasted so good. Although the crust had blackened on the bottom, we realized we had the fire too hot. We pulled out some wood from the fire to decrease the temperature for the second and third pizzas, and the crust turned out perfect. The black flakes in this photo are from the first pizza. The fire looked like this for perfect pizza and... This was the oven setting. With a cold oven, it takes 15 to 20 minutes to reach 450 degrees. 
Larry Winiarski came by just after we cooked the pizza. By sliding the 13-inch long thermometer in and out, John shows Larry that the temperature inside the oven is uniform, no matter where it is being measured. Next, we cooked a beautiful and tasty Marion Berry pie. Flip told me to cook it at 400 degrees Fahrenheit for 50 minutes. It was very easy to maintain the temperature at 400 just by pushing the wood in a little bit forward in the rocket stove every 10 minutes. We also cooked a batch of rolls at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. They were a little over brown on the bottom, but had perfect texture. Next time, we will put a spacer under the pan to prevent overbrowning. Larry and I celebrate yet another adaptation of Larry's original rocket stove idea. We'd like to see your photos of your innovations put to use all around the world.